Thank you for the introduction, and uh, I have looked forward to this time together because um, a couple of times I've been here before were just absolutely delightful, and I really do look forward to spending this time with you these three mornings. I, I love to talk about story and about telling the story. I think it's important for those of us who preach, for those of us who teach Sunday school, for those, those of us who have children and grandchildren, maybe the most important reason to talk about story is about... Uh, this morning I would like to talk about why story, why I'd be interested in story. Tomorrow morning the question is, what's the story? And uh, on Friday morning, some guidelines on telling stories and how we can go about this, how we can understand it. Uh, let's start this morning with a familiar story from the Bible, the story of Jonah. Story of Jonah since we were children. I hope we see the humor in it. If we miss the humor, we miss a whole lot. Uh, here God calls a prophet, an orthodox prophet, to preach. I used to say, uh, telling this story, that that's kind of like his calling one of us to say, I want you to go to Moscow and preach. It, we kind of have to modify that now, but that's kind of the feeling of it. Nineveh was the most dreaded place on earth. Their enemies, an evil empire, to use Reagan's phrase. Now, that was north and east of Jerusalem, across land. So Jonah takes off and goes northwest to the seaport, gets on a boat, and goes just as far away as he possibly can. Gets on the boat, get a storm, and this is important, the pagan sailors, pagan sailors say to him, who are you and what creator of heaven and earth? <laughs> you are the servant of the one who made all of this, we're out here in a boat with you, and you're running away from this God that created this? Wonderful. Well, what are we going to do? We, well, and here's the way Jonah is. Just throw me overboard. Just throw me overboard. They throw him overboard. The great fish swallows him up. Three days, nights in the fish, he gets religion. Fish tosses him up on the beach, seaweed around his neck, spitting out salt water, he hears God say to him, Now, will you go to Nineveh? And Jonah says, All right, I'm ready. <laughs> he goes to Nineveh. He preaches at city. And Jonah goes and sits on the side of the mountain to watch, ready to do it, do it to him, burn him to a crisp. The gourd grows up over his head. He's in the shade. I see him there with a glass of iced tea. Those of us from West Texas use iced tea, you know, as a creature comfort. And Now do it, Lord. And then listen to this de delicious, delicious touch. And God ordained a worm. Did you ever notice that? Now God called Jonah to do something, and Jonah was <coughs> God called the worm to do. We see that? The worm cut the root of this vine, the vine withered, Jonah is really, really ticked off. God hasn't burned the city to a crisp. Now the gourd vine is wilted. He says, I knew it. I knew it. It's that same old steadfast love of the Lord. I knew you weren't going to do it. You promised to do these things. You won't do it. Now the gourd vine's gone. And God says to Jonah, we got a city, a vast city out here. I know the right hand from the left. And you're concerned about a gourd vine? Why did God, through his spirit, inspire some writer to tell us the story, story of Jonah instead of having an essay on missions? <laughs> See, you could have an essay on missions which says, point one, history. God called Abraham for his family to be a blessing to all the nations. Point two, God loves all people and goes into God's love. He made all people be more receptive than you think. So, conclusion, get out of here and go do it. Why, why did God lead 
the writer to tell us the story of Jonah, the story of Jonah instead of an essay with uh, two or three points, main points, and a conclusion. That's really the question this morning. Why story? And I've got seven reasons. That's a good biblical number, isn't it? So we can feel complete. Seven reasons I want to share with you this morning. First of all, our lives are stories with a beginning and a middle and an end. We know something the way, about the way they began. We know something about what's going on in the middle, but we don't really know when we're going to die, how we're going to die, what that's going to be like. There's some suspense here. And we love to tell our stories. You know, whether, whether uh, we are excited, happy, and proud, and we want to tell it, or whether we're in the pits in despair, we need somebody to listen, listen to me, listen to my story. Our lives are stories. If we go to get a job application, uh, uh, a job interview, we have already submitted our resume, which is kind of an outline of our story. This is where I was born, this is where I went to school, this is what I've worked, where I've worked, what I've done, this is my story. And the person sitting over here interviewing looks at this and <coughs> says, well, I know something about him, I know something about her because here is the story. The counselor or the psychologist says, well, tell me how this happened. And we tell the story. Our lives are stories. Our lives are not syllogisms. Our lives are not essays. They're stories. That's one of the reasons that we love it. Number two, reason number two. We are inspired by and shaped by story more than anything else. Uh, think about the American stories that have shaped our mindset as Americans. Um, George Washington and the cherry tree that we read when we were kids down in the grades, which is supposed to teach us honesty. The little engine that could What's that about? What's that? Star Wars, and God forbid, Rambo. <laughs> but stories, stories, stories. We listen to these stories. I had a, a kind of, I've had a kind of a hobby over the years on planes, and that is to look around and see what people are reading. When I first started that, they were reading Jonathan Livingston Seagull, and then they were reading. Uh, Donald Trump, which isn't quite so much popular now, but somebody else will come in to take <coughs> his place. Not because he's a great writer, but because he got where they want to go. They want to know his story because I love for my story to be like his story. Or Lee Iacocca or whatever. Stories shape us, they inspire us, they give us direction and inspiration. There are wonderful stories like Mother Teresa, Albert Schweitzer, not formulas, not essays, not debate briefs, stories. A rabbi named Goldberg, Michael Goldberg, went to Union Seminary in New York and tasted of Christian theology, and he wrote a book. He entitled, Getting Our Stories Straight. He said, and we're going to talk about this more tomorrow, but he said there are two master stories for the Jews and the Christians. For the Jews, it's the Exodus, and for the Christians, it's the cross. Now, in the introduction, listen to this sentence. Our stories not only inform us, they form us. That's really true, if you think about it. I understand uh, my friend Jack Reese mentioned last night some of his childhood experiences. He and I grew up in Abilene. I'm a few years older. In fact, I used to cut his hair when I was barbering with my daddy in the barbershop, and he was a little boy, but that's another story. But my first memory, my first introduction to God was my mother reading to me from Hurlbut's storybook of the Bible. <laughs> 
every time I tell this, half the people nod. And I can still remember the picture of Joseph with a coat of many colors, Daniel in the lion's den, Jesus on the cross, Paul on the missionary journeys, and this is where I met God in these stories. I'll bet that's true with many of you, whether in Sunday school or at Mama's Knee or Daddy read it to me or whatever. These stories grip us and they, they shape us and they form us. We love stories. You know, a kid at bedtime will say, tell me a story. You'll never hear a child say, uh, give me that syllogism again. Would you tell me your three points in the debate brief? <laughs> would, would you give me an essay? Would you tell me your philosophy? Now there's a problem in that a lot of us adults are so grown up that we think we've outgrown story and we say, well, stories are for children, aren't they? Well, novels sell pretty well, don't they? What percentage of the television is occupied with telling stories and movies and plays and operas and we're going to see all of us children of all ages love stories. Third reason, the world we live in needs story. Um, years ago, took its truth from authority. Teacher could just say God's word, and so this, 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 and the world pretty well accepted it on authority. That's not true today. We live in a scientific world which reasons not deductively, not a big premise and so and so and so, but inductively. This, 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 and so. That's the scientific way of looking at things. Look at all the data and come to a conclusion. That's the way the world thinks. In fact, if you think about it a minute, that's the way you live your life. When Mother's Day comes, what do you think about? Do you think about a concept of motherhood? Or do you think about your mother? Fred Craddock in one of his books says that the farmer doesn't deal with calfhood. He deals with this calf. This calf. Now what does that got to do with story? Story is inductive. This happens, this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens, and this is the way it comes out. See? It speaks to where our world is today, and if we want to talk to where the world is, we have to pay attention to story and to look at story. Reason number what? I'm losing track here. Four. Story creates community. I, you know, we don't have much patriotism some days, some of these times, and I, I think one of the reasons for that is that we don't have anymore the 4th of July celebrations that they used to have 50 years ago in the little town where they have a parade and somebody, the mayor or the preacher of the Baptist church or somebody, gets up and tells, now our grandparents, our great-grandparents came over to this country and so on like this and we had the 4th of <coughs> July and the Declaration of Independence and so on. That's why we are who we are. See, that is our story. That makes us who we are, whether we're Chinese or Italian or Scotch or whatever, that makes us Americans, that story. Now, this is true in the Old Testament. We have Passover and the youngest child says at the table, this is the formula. This is a set routine. And it happens the same way every year. They don't say, oh my goodness, let's jazz it up and be different this year. No, no. Same way every year. The youngest child says, why is this night different from all other nights? And the father, notice this, guys. The father knows the story. He doesn't say, ask your mother. <laughs> the father says, we, notice this first word, we, not they, we 
were slaves in Egypt. And that's the way the story begins. And by the time he gets through telling the story, this child and this child and this child, hearing it every year, as they tell the story and take the bitter herbs and they take all of this, they live the exodus again. And that makes us who we are. Now what is the story that makes, and what is it that pulls us together as community that is comparable to the Passover? Right. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. We take bread. And he said, this is my covenant. This is the covenant in my blood, and we take the fruit of the vine, and that makes us who we are. No matter where we came from, what our background is, we need to have that, and we do have that story. Somebody gets up and tells, this is what happens, and this is why we are a community. Now, I want to make a point here, and I don't want to be too polemical, but I want to make a point that what pulls us together and makes us community, really community, is not that we all agree on this doctrine, or we've all hammered out this issue. That is not what makes the church the church. What makes the church the church is that somebody says, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. Let's take bread. And that pulls us together, and that makes us community. Through the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says again and again, don't tell, don't tell, don't tell. You don't have the story yet. After the death, burial, and resurrection, he says, tell. They have the story. That's what makes us community. Now, if you follow that through Acts, you find out that's what made people Christians, and that's what made the church the church. Peter said, this Jesus whom you crucified, God lift up and made him Lord in Christ. He told the story. 3,000 said, oh, God help us, what will we do? You repent and be baptized. They were. The church was... You'll see Peter and then Paul telling this same story. You crucified him. God raised him up. Same story. Same story. Makes the church the church. One on the basis of arguments. The church is not made on, made on arguments. The church is the church because of the story. So if preachers can't tell the story, we're in big trouble. If mamas and daddies can't tell it, we're in trouble. Um, I had an uncle. This is one of my earliest memories. You, you probably have a memory like this. A few times in my early years, we got together with my uncle and aunt and my cousin Harold and uh, my three brothers, mom and dad and I, and my grandmother, Parker, and Uncle Newman would tell the Christmas story. Now, it's not, it's not Dickens' story and it's not out of Luke. It was our story. It was about the Christmases, which started in 1906 or something. We were in Kansas, and we came across here, and we lived in New Mexico. We lived in a dugout, and then we lived in a lean-to. You remember, and I, I don't know why this sticks with me so much, but he says, it was so cold, that little house, you could throw a cat through the wall just about anywhere. I don't know why that stuck with me, but I just love that. I couldn't wait to hear him say, you could throw a cat through the wall. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but by the time he got through telling... Yeah, he said, talking about my mother, and he used to get one, one apple or one orange and a piece of hard candy for Christmas. And one Christmas, he got a piece of candy in the shape of a pig. My Uncle Newman was one of these who saved and hoarded, and that, that's why he was rich. But he was when he was a little boy. He kept this. And the other two kids ate theirs. And they came to him and said, Newman, let's butcher that pig. Let's butcher that pig. I don't know why I remember this, but I love this. And this tells me who I am. What The story that pulls us together determines who we are. The KKK has one story. 
the Third Reich had another story. We have another story. We need to know what it is. Okay, number whatever it is. What are we on now? Five? Number five, we need to love God with our whole mind. Jesus said, with your heart, your soul, and your mind. In the Restoration tradition, we've been loving him with about half of our mind. You know, we talk about the right brain and the left brain. The left brain is that analytical, logical part of us, and we must have it. Thank God he made us this way. But we also have a right brain, which has imagination <coughs> and creativity. And we're supposed to love God with our whole mind. That's why God had somebody write Jonah's story down, is because, you see, there is this beautiful telling with some imagination about how this happened with Jonah. You know, we go from Campbell back to John Locke to Francis Bacon, very analytical, analytical. But we don't know what to do with story. We don't hear Jesus tells parable after parable after parable. And I, I just want to point this up, that some of his enemies really hated these silly little stories. Because when we're legalists, we don't want any stories. We want rules. Now, how can you control a story? A story can do a lot of different things, you know. Watch out about stories. <coughs> if you've read C.S. Lewis, The Chronicles of Narnia, and here is a, here is a lion, Aslan the lion, and Aslan is this enormous, tame, he's enormous, gentle lion. And the children can hang on his mane and, and ride right on his back. But the day comes when they see him strapped down, tied down with ropes, and killed. Another part of the story says, now don't misunderstand. Aslan is not a tamed lion. Now, if we can't get that, then we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing here? Now, the Gospel of Mark, for example. Why is it in the Gospel of Mark, from the first verse through the eighth chapter, exactly halfway through, he says he's the Son of God, and he does all of these mighty, wonderful, powerful things, and he looks every inch the Son of God. Halfway through the book, Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem to suffer and die. And from that point on, he somehow, even though he's the Son of God, submits himself to the disciples' stupid questions and misunderstandings, to the crowds, to Judas, to the cross. What's Mark doing here? Son of God, in the first verse, and on the cross, the centurion says at the end of the story, surely this was the Son of God. But Son of God here means something different by the time it gets down here. Mark wasn't just saying, they need to have the facts <clears throat> of Jesus. No, no. He's doing something with this story. And the key verse is, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We need to love God with our whole, whole mind. The next reason, the Bible is a storybook, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow. It's full of stories. Hebrews chapter 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, the writer's going to get, tick off he just assumes that whoever's reading this knows these stories. I assume, looking at this group, that most of us know the stories. I hope we do. If we went down that checklist, we could, I hope, tell most of those stories, but I wonder whether our children know them. I really do. 
I think our children are learning that God loves them, that they need to have self-worth and self-image, which is wonderful. But I'm wondering if they could read Hebrews 11 and tell what those stories are. The Bible, you know, could have been written in other ways. God could have made it a concordance. God could have made it a Knave's topical Bible, or the modern version of that is the computer program where you punch faith, and you have here all of these references to faith. He could have made it that way. He could have made it an essay. He could have made it a debate brief. But the truth is, it starts at the beginning and it goes to the end. It starts with God and his children in fellowship and then something happens. There is a tree. And at the other end, God is back with his children and there's a tree. And all of these forms of literature Psalms, debate briefs, letters, all are part of the story of God and human beings. The Bible is a story. Hebrews, we read about the high priest, the sacrifice, and all that. If we don't know what the, uh, that story is, well, it doesn't mean anything to us. Now, I'm not saying that every chapter, verse, and so on is story. That's not true. But I'm saying there's an overarching story of which all of these forms of literature are part. We live in a storytelling tradition if we are Christians who come out of the Jewish tradition. If you ask a rabbi a question, he won't give you three points, a poem, and an invitation. <laughs> He'll say to you, uh, I'll tell you a story. Now, I have a book my daughter gave me called The Big Book of Jewish Humor, and it's a big book. I love it. Now here's one of these stories. A modern story the Jews love. The old man wouldn't stop complaining. Oi, I'm thirsty. Oi, I'm thirsty. But while the train was in motion, there was nothing that could be done. At the first stop, three passengers rushed out to bring the old man a glass of water. When the train pulled up out of the station, the car was blessedly quiet until suddenly the old man's voice broke through hoarsely, Boy, I was thirsty. <laughs> now see, they could just say, instead of telling that story, they could just say, some people are hard to please. <laughs> Now, which would you rather hear? The branch of Judaism is kind of the flaky. Ref Here's another story. A reformed rabbi was so compulsive a golfer, this is for Roy Osborne here, <coughs> was so compulsive a golfer that once on Yom Kippur, he left the house early and went out for a quick nine holes by himself. An angel who happened to be looking on immediately notified his superiors that a grievous sin was being committed on earth. <laughs> on the sixth hole, God caused a mighty wind to take the ball directly from the tee to the cup for a miraculous and dramatic hole in one. The angel was horrified. Lord, he said, you call this a punishment? Sure, answered God with a smile. Who can he tell? <laughs> now would you rather have that or would you rather somebody say to you secret sins have a way of finding us out point one, point two, point three we live in a storytelling tradition whether we know it or not the Bible is a story and number seven I think are we at seven I don't know this is our last, uh, our last one. We need to tell stories for those who've heard it all before. Now those of us who are preaching and teaching every week are talking to people who've heard it all before and say, here we go again. Born and bred Christians, or as a... 
a doctor at Bering Drive likes to call us. He came from the Methodist Church to the Church of Christ. And when he gets kind of ticked off, he'll say, well, you congenital Church Christers. <laughs> Um, now there's some of us here if the preacher gets up and says today I'm going to talk about baptism and why we ought to be baptized what baptism means in the New Testament I think there's some of us here that could pretty well make that outline we're baptized by a by a believer confession not as infants we're baptized by immersion not sprinkling we're baptized in order to be saved not because we're saved I don't know maybe you haven't heard this but a lot of us have now let me ask you there's another way to say this now all those things are very important and I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying that a lot of us have heard it and 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 so we say it's time for a nap. Now there's another way to say this. You take Mark's gospel, for example, and here comes up and says, the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem to suffer and die. His decision. Next chapter the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem to suffer and die. Third cha Next chapter, the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem, have conflicts with the chief priest and the rabbis. They're going to spit upon him and scoff him and crucify him, and he will be raised the third day. Yes, James and John, what is it? Can we sit on your right hand and your left when you come into your kingdom? You just don't get it, do you? Three times I've said to you, I'm going to suffer and die, and you're wanting to be in the cabinet of this great kingdom. Listen to this. I have a baptism with which I will be baptized. Are you ready to do that? Oh, yes. Really? Really? You see, Jesus has chosen and said three times that he has chosen, not his mother and his daddy, but he has chosen to go do this. And he calls this a baptism. He's going to be overwhelmed with whatever's going to happen. Totally immersed in whatever happens. And then he says, For even the Son of Man came not to be so give his life a ransom for many. Why is he going to, why is he choosing to do this? Why is he going to be totally submerged in this to be a ransom for many? And at the end of this story, Jesus says to the disciples, go into all the world and tell this, baptizing them. Whoever believes this story and is baptized will be saved. So that's a story on, that's a sermon on baptism in story form and I think personally that that's where we ought to root our theology of baptism because this tells what it's about and this tells us who gave it to us and what the meaning of it is and for those who've heard it a thousand times it's new you know, there's more, more than one way to skin a cat. And in all of this, that those parts of the Bible that are not story or not important or less important, I'm not saying anything like that. We have to have logical developments, like Romans, for example. <coughs> it's one of the most logically uh, reasoned passages in all the Bible. Starts out, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, and then you Gentiles... Now he's got a problem here in this little church in Rome and that is they've, they've got conflict going on between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. Who's going to run the church is the question of the book of Romans. Now first of all, you Gentiles need to remember where you came from. You dismissed God from your minds 
you were disobedient parents, homosexuality, and all of that. And the Jews are saying, give it to him, Paul, give it to him. He says, second chapter, now you Jews who are so proud, what about you? You use the law as a kind of a merit badge. We're God's people. We have a law. We have circumcision. Really? You keep the law? Chapter 3. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified by Jesus in his cross. And then the rest of the book talks about the meaning of that. And the point of the book of Romans is, who's in charge here? We're all sinners. We're all equal. We're all under the grace of God. Jesus is in charge. Now that's one way to say that. Jesus said it another way. Two men went up to the temple to pray. Listen to this. Little story. This big. Same message. One said, Oh God, I am so thankful that you have a servant like myself. Kind of like a junior lawyer reporting to the, to the senior lawyer. I do this, I do this, I do this. And this other man comes in and he doesn't even know whether he needs to be there. He can hardly lift his head and just said, simp says, simply says, Forgive me, I'm a sinner. Now this man went home right with God and the other one didn't. Do we see that that's the same thing told in two different forms? We need both forms. I'm just pointing up that Romans and the logical form is not the only way to do it. In fact, we were talking about our world a while ago in our scientific mindset, our need for inductive reasoning and all that. We probably need to look at Jesus as a model more than Paul because, see, Paul was off talking to Gentiles who had never heard any of this. None of this was threadbare to him. But Jesus was talking to people who stood in the tradition for several thousand years, heard it all before. And he told it in a story form. Well, we said this, this morning that the reason we ought to learn to tell stories because our lives are stories. Because we're shaped by the stories we hear and we love to hear them. Because the modern world doesn't take things on authority. It takes things inductively. And a story is a kind of induction. Because we should love God with our whole mind, not just with our rational side. Because the story, the Bible is a story, and because story makes community. I want to uh, allow a few minutes now for discussion, and then I want to end with a little story. Does anybody have anything you want to talk about?